I could record the um, TSA chords. Oh, yeah. What do you have in that bag? <laughs> A bomb. <laughs> okay, well, you can't get on the airplane then. Yeah. You're going to have to take your bomb elsewhere. Hello, Video Rangers, and welcome back. That that has been is that which shall be. And that that has been done is that which shall be done. And there is nothing new under the sun, but here in the hermetically sealed safety and shade of my bunker, I've got John Appleton with me. John, what have you been up to? Living. I, I know recently you uh, uh, you did exercise a little bit of freedom and uh, w went on quite the vacation. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your, your vacation? <laughs> that was fake vacation. Everybody had said... Oh, you're lucky, and how lucky you are, and, but it was all fake. You were in Nighthawks? Yes, and I was in a painting of Matt Busey. So this is part of the, the vacation videos, or is this just a painting that he has? I think, he... Oh, after. Okay. He did several portraits of me, uh, but he won't release them because he's not satisfied, satisfied with them. They're, they're classified. Well, yeah, yes, you could say that. Well, maybe they could be redacted. Maybe he can just put a big black bar over the parts that he's not happy with. That's the face. <laughs> That's the face. Well, there's plenty of uh, like great you know, Greek sculptures that are missing their heads. And That's right. Nobody poo-poos that. But I don't want to be beheaded. <laughs> There's a few uh, uh, films that I'm aware of that you've been in. Moscow Meat. Moscow Meat uh, is uh, t probably the one that comes first and foremost to mind. <laughs> Moscow Meat! Moscow Meat! <laughs> oh, that's a cult favorite. And I played four or five Russian characters. And they're all uh, Russian. Well, they're mostly all Russian composers. There's one dancer as well. Oh. Yes, one dancer and, and a car mechanic. A plastic they now made with the tin picks, but you just put it in the engine. A conductor, a pianist, and that was filmed at the original Main Street Museum. Oh, was it? But So you must have had body doubles. Gabriel... Q. Ah, uh, okay. I was wondering who was in it. Um, I was wondering if you remembered what um, the ingredients were for Moscow meat. Oh, yes. Of course. Uh, dog food. <laughs> dog food with um, uh, Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. You sent me an article um, from the Valley News about kind of your frustrations with Dartmouth at one point. I resigned from Dartmouth maybe 10 years ago yeah and it was part of it was the administration thinking you were taking too hard on the students and that's right there was a very rich student or the family was at which he said to me i pay your salary you should get me a a and i didn't <laughs> but the dean you know was beholden to the largesse of the donors. Mm -hmm. I had 100 students in them, and she changed all the grades for A. Well, something that in, that comes up in Moscow Meet is um, one of the Russians talks about their, their, their teaching techniques. Um, and I was oh, wondering yes. if you ever, um, if, if that was something you ever implemented with uh, your students. <laughs> Did you wrap yeah. their hands in chains, and when they messed up, you tied it tighter? You know, I've been working on the train gang. When I was young, I wanted to be a pianist, a um, ballet dancer, a fireman, a cowboy, and a composer. How many of those things did you get to be? Just a composer. I think you've been a cowboy. <laughs> Cowboys is all in the attitude, I think. Maybe you need chaps, but we could get you chaps. You know, I was born in Hollywood, California. There was a theater called the Hitching Post for young kids, and you had to check your six comes <laughs> really? at the door. It sounds like you've lived a little bit of a, a rough-and-tumble cowboy sort of life, so... Oh, yeah. Oh, we, yeah. We can give you partial credit. How about that? Okay. We'll complain to the dean and... We'll say you get the cowboy credit. So 
you became a pianist, but you also uh, became kind of a, a pioneer in electronic music. And so how did how did that get started? I was one of the first composers to compose electronic music in the United States. How did you even have access to uh, electronic uh, equipment? That was in the University of Oregon. I managed to assemble one tape recorder, an oscillator, a filter, all of the physics labs equipment, and I connected them, and I just made experimental pieces. I see. So nowadays you might get a, a modular synth that has oscillators and filters and all these knobs in it as, right. as a de dedicated music device that's right but so you were using equipment that what its its purpose was for something else audio testing i see i met a, a brilliant inventor in norwich who worked at this Thayer school of engineering his name is city alonso oh gosh he's a genius he said you don't want to have all these oscillators and Moog equipment. We can build a digital oscillator. We had a student in common, Cameron Jones, and he did the programming, and I did the design of the keyboards and buttons, and they manufactured it, and the name is New England Digital. And that used to be... Right above the the uh, Upper Valley Co-op, correct? Oh, no. First in Norwich. Oh, okay. Across from Dan and Witz, the first Synclavier, which was called the Synclavier, sold for $13,000. What, what, what separated the, the Synclavier from other synthesizers at the time? Uh, digital oscillators, FM, live recording of audio, music notation, editing. The users were Frank Zappa, Oscar Peterson. In fact, I've got uh, Frank Zappa's uh, memoir right here. Um, yeah. And he's got a section in it. Uh, most of my compositions today are written uh, on and performed by a machine, a computer musical instrument called Synclavier. It allows me to create and record a type of music that is impossible or too boring for human beings to play. <laughs> Michael Jackson toured with him, mm -hmm. Pat Metheny, but I was the only electronic music composer that toured with it. You a second ago uh, put quotes around uh, electronic uh, musician. What separates an electronic musician, do you think, from, say, someone like Frank Zappa or something like that? I don't know. I can't say. I can pose uh, a question to you that was posed in one of your uh, pieces. What do you think of the new electronic music? <laughs> well, I like it. I mean, I love it. Oh, I like it very much. It's all right. I never heard of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really had no issues ever. It's a different experience from any kind of music. You don't have preconceptions. Just go with the flow. There are all kinds of sounds, minimalist sounds, natural sounds. That was my gift to electronic music because I introduced real life sounds and recorded sounds in it. Whereas before they'd been completely synthesized That's sounds. Right. Yeah. That's right. Something that uh, Frank Zappa brings up in that same passage is, um, at least at the time, there is this um, kind of backlash that if you take a musician into a studio and record various tones and then bring that into a synclavier that you're in some way stealing the soul of the musician because then you can just synthesize them. What do you think about things like that? Or did you ever run into something like that? No, I made my original sounds on the synclavier and the mold. So you stole your own soul. Yeah, I don't think it's for the masses. <laughs> it's a niche, uh, a, a niche, niche, why can't a niche, niche market? You're or is it niche? getting my disease. Three, four years ago, I had a stroke, and I couldn't speak at all. Oh, I really? I lost all my languages. It's interesting. You said 
all your languages. How many uh, languages did you have under your belt? Swedish, French, Tongan, Russian, Japanese, Spanish, and German. Wow, what, one of them started with a T. I didn't even recognize it. Haha, Tonga. Tonga. Tonga is a kingdom between Fiji and Samoa, and it's ruled by a king. I took 12 Dartmouth students. Well, we were the only foreign students ever to come there, and we studied language, singing, dancing. Say you like to be alone now. For example, if a young man wants to propose to a woman, he has to make up a, an original song and poems for her. Really? Yeah. How did you gain interest in Tonga or that, that region, and how did it end up uh, influencing your compositions? I had just moved to Vermont, and that's the first time I was ever in the winter. I said, what in hell this is, this <laughs> snow? <laughs> So I went to the library and I got atlases and I found this little speck on the South Pacific. And uh, I said, well, I'll go there. Dartmouth had been become co-ed. That, that had just happened recently? Yes. Oh, wow. 72 or something. 70. Mm -hmm. They were desperate to have off-country programs. <laughs> I went to the dean. I said, I have a proposal. I want to take 12 students to the kingdom of Tonga. And he said, you know, John, it's a bad idea. <laughs> so I went down. I've never been in the South Pacific before, but it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the subject of kind of uh, foreign affairs, uh, you also helped found uh, the, a theremin center in Moscow. Theremin was a Russian, mm -hmm. and, and he was a spy. Really? I didn't know that. Yes, but he constructed several instruments that he used to play by waving your hands. When composers in Moscow Conservatory wanted to learn electronic music, they had no money there to teach them. I went and assembled an international body, and I taught there for a number of years, only in January. <laughs> you went from the cold of Vermont, New Hampshire, to the extra cold of Moscow. Oh, yeah. I'm very influenced by Russian music because I was raised by a Russian who played in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. I was in the orphanage from two to six. My mother married us, my Russian, Russian stepfather, and she said, you can't leave there's kids in the orphanage. And so he took me to his home. And he, so he was I, a, a double bass player, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that became a and an, an, he became quite the influence on you. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I was a serious piano student, but I didn't practice. Yeah, you know, would sit down to the piano, and I would start to play the music I was assigned, mm -hmm. Chopin or something, and I didn't like it. I mean, I liked the <laughs> music, but I. It wasn't easy. Yeah. So I just made up my own music. <laughs> and that was really good. And I still do that today in the village at White River. I play every day, improvise. On, on the topic of uh, compositions, I just wrote down a few. I already mentioned Newark Airport Rock and San Francisco oh, yeah. Airport uh, uh, Rock. Uh, uh, Okay, I was stranded in January of that again in New York, New York Airport with my tape reporter because I used to collect sounds. It was snowed in, and I went to all the passengers and said, What do you think of new electronic music? What do you think of new electronic music? What do you think of new? And they said, 
computer technology. Oh, I like it. <laughs> and I was wondering and, um, what people were talking about because they were saying the music that you hear on airplanes. And I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I was wondering, it's like, did airplanes used to play <laughs> kind of experimental no. music? Keeps you occupied while you're on, on the flight. I will Sherman Chauveau Airport Rock, the Sherman Chauveau. Is the airport in Moscow? Oh, okay, you did one there as well. Yes, Tokyo Narita Airport Rock, San Francisco Airport Rock. Maybe it's about time for uh, Lebanon Airport Rock. Silence. <laughs> uh, let's see. So some other ones on here. Uh, the the Snow Queen. Oh yes, <laughs> the Snow Queen. I wrote two melodramas. I narrated the story. And played the piano, I mean a synclavier, at the same time. Synclavier and playing piano at the same time? No, no. Yes, okay. Just, just for the synclavier. I only did that once. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a piece for Oscar Peterson, which I play on the piano and synclavier. Wow. But it's not good. It's, it's not, not good. good. I also adapted the tell, Tale of William Mariner, and that's placed in Tonga. Oh, is it? William Mariner was shipwrecked on the in Tonga. One more song here that uh, I, I thought might be interesting. It's um, uh, Sasha Dijon. Sasha was my stepfather. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The son of Sasha Dijon. Oh, okay. The son of Sasha. I mean, my, my dad, I told you, my stepfather, he was, when he heard my first pieces, well, he didn't want to hear that. I mean, he, he didn't believe that was music. He said, drop out of music. When I got a master's, he said to me, hey, John, have you considered law school? So what's interesting about this song, I thought, was because I was just scanning through your, your Wikipedia page, and someone has decided that this, this is the song that you can preview. It says, like, here's all of John Appleton's songs. This is the one that it is most representational of uh, your music. I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? If you had to pick one song that uh, summed up your entire body of work, which one do you think you would pick? The Sweet Dreams of Miss Pamela Beach summarizes all my musical tastes and electronic and classical and it's lovely and exciting and restful and all of it. You know what? Who Miss Pamela Beach is? I don't. That's my third wife. Oh, really? Her name is Esme Thompson. Her original name was Pamela Esme Beach. I composed that for her, and I like it very much. I think it's my favorite. I think it's my favorite piece. So that that's kind of like your uh, Tongan song. Yeah, that's right. So fairly color. <laughs> <laughs> 